Hello and welcome to the Admin Bar, the community that helps you streamline your process, sharpen your skills, and demand higher paying projects. Today is March 12th of 2019, and this is episode 20, titled Our Biggest Takeaways and Ask Us Anything. And Matt and I will be talking about some of the best lessons we've learned from our guests thus far on the show, which was kind of an interesting experience going through and looking back at all of those. So I think we pulled out some really good nuggets, especially for those of you who are newer to the show. Uh, you don't have to go back and watch it all now. You can just listen to this one. You're good. My name is Kyle Van Dusen from Ogle, Web's, Ogle Web Design, just outside of Fort Worth, Texas. And with me, as always, is my co-host, Matt Siebert from Matthew Siebert Designs. What is going on, Matt? Not a whole lot, Kyle. It's been a while since it's just been the uh, the two of us on here. I know. I feel like we should have a song or something. <laughs> the Kyle and Matt song. Yes, or like a slow embrace, like little uh, intro clip. Mm, yeah, we could do that. We could. Well, before we get started here, I do want to uh, to let everybody know, I know I've posted several times about it and sent some emails out, but Dave Foy is opening his No Fear Funnels course for 48 hours only starting today at noon Eastern. Uh, so three and a half hours, something like that from now. Um, and it is going to be on sale at the old price for this last time in june he'll be opening it up officially again and it's about 150 dollars more so uh, i i started the course when he first launched it actually while it was in pre-sale and it has by far been the best course i've taken uh you know wordpress related non-wordpress related it's been better than i would say all of the college courses i took and more valuable to me and my business so i definitely want you know, if anybody's interested in it at all, uh, definitely go check it out. You can go to theadminbar.com forward slash funnel flash, all one word, F-U-N-N-E-L-F-L-A-S-H. And I see here that we have people considering taking it. I'm telling you, it really is awesome. Uh, I did a little walkthrough video of my dashboard so you can kind of see everything that's inside of it. Uh, there's a ton of stuff. In fact, because I did it while it was pre-sale, he was actually building the course as we were going through it. So we got to kind of shape some of the modules and give feedback and stuff, which was cool, but it took me a long time to go through the course as he was building it. So I'm actually in the process now of starting from the beginning and like trying to roll through it quickly. And, and I'm already catching things that I missed the first time, you know, so it's, it's helped me a ton. Um, it's helped me kind of position the way I sell my value to clients a lot. Um, but yeah, I definitely, definitely think you should check it out. Um, Dave is going to be doing a Facebook Live on his Design Build Web uh, Facebook page today, I think around 2 Eastern, 3 Eastern, something like that. I'll share it into the group. Um, but he's going to be going through the dashboard, answering questions and stuff. So if you have questions and you want to um, get those straight from Dave, you can ask him today or you're welcome to message me. I'll be around. I'll be glad to answer any questions I can. So definitely check it out. I know there's quite a few people in our group that uh, are part of No Fear Funnels, and I'm sure they would tell you the same things I'm telling you. Uh, coming up next week, we do have on episode 21, we're going to have Devender on the show for the first time, and he is going to be talking to us about finding work remotely. For those of you that don't know, Devender is in India, but he does not do any local work whatsoever, and he has a really successful agency. Uh, so we're going to be, I know we've had people ask questions before in the group about trying to find work remotely like that. And we kind of have a little bit of privilege that, you know, here where me and Matt both live, we have businesses all around us that are willing to spend money, but not everybody's in that same situation. So I think it'd be interesting to get some insights from Devender on how he's kind of built up his clientele uh, working remotely. And uh, I also wanted to tell y'all before we get started, uh, go check out Outsource.Services, which is a project Chris Castillo has launched where you can list your business on there. If you do white label work, you can also find uh, great partners to business uh, to great businesses to partner with if you are looking for things like copywriting or Facebook ads or you know just about anything. Thing that's related to the marketing field, you can find people that are in our community uh, that have listings on there, read reviews, all those kinds of things. You can get a free listing. Just go to outsource.services and get started. All right, Matt. So what are we doing today on this episode? Let's get it. Uh, let's 
let's get a little run sheet going and let's let's do this damn thing yeah totally so uh like you said we're gonna go through all of the episodes up until today and uh just pull out the the bits that stuck with us the most um and uh at the uh at the end of the show we actually we took a lot of questions from the uh, the community and we'll be answering those so those are going to be about running your business and like us personally as well um you know just a, a a hodgepodge of different questions uh so definitely stick around with that there's we actually we put a poll on uh on the facebook group and so we have all of the uh the questions that people are most interested in yes absolutely so we'll get to all those and we do have kind of a special little sneak peek at a surprise of something we're working on but i'm not going to say anything uh-oh kyle just froze you think about um, it till you stick around or fast forward do what kyle you just froze oh great you're good great though. all right yeah well hopefully that crappy internet connection is going to be fixed this afternoon so i have uh i've closed watching our live stream so if you're there live asking questions i will not see it maybe matt can take a look at it so Let's just get this thing underway. So uh, me and Matt are going to take turns at all these episodes. I have the odd episodes. Matt has the even episodes. We're going to just completely skip over episode one because nobody should watch episode one. Don't do it. Yeah. No. It's... We're both a little, like, a little bit timid and uh, unsure of ourselves yeah. at that point. You know that means everybody's going to go watch it now. Yeah. So if you want to make fun of us, go watch episode one. So let's dig into episode two, Matt. Okay, so uh, episode two was in-house staff versus outsourcing with uh, Chris Castillo and Paul Lacey. <clears throat> uh, so this was the first like actual episode that we did with uh, with real life human beings, which was uh, was it was awesome, man. Like it was super cool, and you know, for the first episode, having Chris and Paul on, like these two guys, like they're just they're so warm and welcoming and just great people in general. Um, so. Basically, I mean, my my uh, my takeaway from this one is that a little over the the halfway point in that episode, Paul and Chris started talking about uh, finding the right folks uh, that work with your uh, work best with you and your current team, and you know the way that they found people or the way that they um, you know not not so much like judged people, but uh, you know the, the questions that you ask and like how you actually find those people that you're going to uh, want to work with and work with well um that definitely for me was uh was the highlight of that that episode yeah and i think we really kind of you know kind of defined the pros and cons of both in-house staff and outsourcing and we definitely had a lot of response from people doing both or you know one or the other we had both sides of the coin so i think there's merit to both and i think a lot of it just comes down to uh, what you're most comfortable with you know for me i never want to hire somebody uh and have them you know, working for me. Um, so I think it just depends on who you are. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <clears throat> All right. So in episode three, we talked about high performance marketing funnels with Dave Foy and Todd Jones. And that's timely because Dave Foy is talking about marketing funnels right now with no fear funnels opening. Uh, so there, there were a ton of awesome things in this. I think, uh, I think both these guys were really good guests. Uh, but there's one thing that like has gone through my brain a hundred times from this episode. And it's when I'm writing content and it's Todd telling me, be clear, not clever. And that's just stuck with me because I'm always trying to like think creatively and how can I phrase this a certain way? And I'm like, you know what? I just need to be clear, not clever. And like, that's just one little, you know, one little sentence he said in the episode, but it's something that's like made such a big impact and stuck with me for so long. And definitely uh, always remember that so I think I think that one has a lot of good uh, value on content creation and stuff so if you're looking at trying to create more content there's that's a really good episode for creating like focused landing page sales page type stuff all right and then moving on to episode four which was future proofing your agency with Lee Jackson and Walt Spence uh, so right out the gate, Lee Jackson brings up uh, diversifying your income streams to generate, uh, you know, income and, and reduce that stress of only having one way to generate revenue. Um, I think that's that's incredibly important because you know, with what we do, there's there's ebbs and flows and there's ups and downs in business. And when you do have you know multiple facets where you're uh, you're generating income, when something does dip it's not nearly as stressful as if it was your only egg. Um, 
you know, and that can be that can be a lot of different things. And they touched on different different ways to do this. Um, so definitely go back, re-listen to that episode. Um, or if you haven't seen it, if you're new, like check it out. Um, you know, but like it could it could be anything from okay, you know, you you build, you design, you uh, you create and launch websites. But there's care plans. That's uh, that's passive income, which is awesome. Um, you know, you can build templates. Like I mean, there's so many different things that you can do to uh, to generate more. And consulting consulting exactly so i think that uh, that that's an awesome takeaway from that episode yeah and another thing like you know there are ebbs and flows and just times when you're busy and times when you're not busy too but our business changes so quickly you know like uh the way websites are now is completely different than they were five years ago and if you only have one skill set and all your eggs are in that basket you know it's it's it could be very scary as technology changes so quickly so i think that's an important lesson for sure so episode five was Define Design with Pisha Neri. And uh, I was really excited about this episode. I remember like the build up to this episode because we were just going to be talking about so many design things. And that's kind of where, you know, me and you come from is the design world. Um, but w what really stood out to me, and it's almost a little embarrassing because I've called myself a designer for 15 years, you know, and that's the work that I've done professionally. But what she said is, you know, people use the word design and what they mean is like styling and aesthetics, but really what design means is planning. And that makes a whole lot of sense because not only do we design a website or design a flyer, but you know, people design a building, people design, you know, uh, all kinds of things, you know, so design is actually, we use it in the meaning of planning a lot, but we don't define it that way very well. And I think there's a lot of, you know, we, we design the site map of the site before, and that, that has nothing to do with like the visual style, style of what the site map looks like. We're actually like designing the framework. So I think mm -hmm. being able to more accurately use the word design and use the word style or aesthetics or something when we're actually talking about the visual part of it, um, I think that's helped me a, a whole ton. And that was something that was like a big light bulb that went off during that show, um, which like I said, I, I just never thought of before. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. That's really well put. Um, Kyle also mentioned before the show today that uh, that was the the last episode before I started growing my beard. So any episode previous to that, I look like a, a big old baby. So yeah, yeah there's that. baby, Matt. Um, moving on to uh, to episode six, we had Liam Clisham on um, from 531. And uh, that was Put Your Passion into Motion. So Liam uh, is outside the norm for our guests. He was a... Uh, a motion designer but um, you know the whole episode kind of revolves around uh, proving that keeping your mindset fluid and not giving up uh, you know it tends to bring great things like Liam his story and the way that uh, that his position or his his business has had repositioned multiple times um, kind of proves that you know you shouldn't give up you shouldn't uh, you know get frustrated if you know what you're doing doesn't quite fit um, you know, shifting and pivoting your business into, uh, into what you enjoy doing and what works for you, uh, that it just, it, it, it opens up the, the possibilities of finding your passion or niche organically. And I think that's incredibly important. Yeah. Especially for the people just starting out, like what I was doing when I first started this business is quite a bit different than actually what I'm focusing on now. And, you know, part of that's just been like that organic journey of me learning the things that I excel at or, you know, what my marketplace is demanding. So, you know, if you, you got to be open to those experiences and those ideas, you know, so you kind of have to have that mindset. So I think that's pretty important too. Yeah. I think like, um, just to add a little bit to that, like nine, eight years ago, um, I was just doing print design. I was doing a lot of illustration work. And I mean, I love that stuff. Um, and I still do. I didn't touch web for quite a while in my business. Um, and now I've pivoted mostly to that, you know, and, and at first it was, it was a bit daunting, you know, there's a lot to learn, but, um, the more I learned, the more like excited I was to, uh, to learn more. So, you know, just organically, I found that web, like it's super fun and like the, uh, the analytical side of it. And like, it's just, it's, it's freaking awesome. So yeah, like cheers to websites. <laughs> Indeed. 
All right. So episode number seven was with Leanne and Imogen, which are both awesome people. And we were kind of talking about, well, the title of the episode was Keep, Keeping Your Business on Track. But what we were really talking about is kind of having some sort of accountability partner or somebody you can like share your business experiences with. So me and Matt kind of lucked into this relationship where we started uh, communicating and started really helping each other with each other's businesses. So we're to the point now where, you know, I can name all of us customers businesses names their you know the contact name everything that's going on with them because we just talk about our business a lot with each other and vice versa um, and it just helps us a ton with you know bouncing ideas off each other or knowing what to do or you know just coming up with uh, creative problem solving ideas you know so we were talking with Leanne and Imogen about that because their relationship actually happened more um, you know they were partnered up uh, you know they found each other for this purpose uh, and they have regular structured calls i think it was every friday they have a call with each other and they discuss things going on with their business uh, whereas me and you are more casual and talk way more often um, but it, it was uh, definitely one consistent consensus we all had was how important this has been to our business and i know my business wouldn't be nearly where it is in the success that i've had had i not done that and if i was trying to do all this like quote unquote on my own uh, let's see. <laughs> Episode eight, man. Uh, pricing your projects for profit with Brett Phillips. Um, th it's really hard to pull out one piece from this episode. Um, I mean, I could literally sit here and just word for word go down that script for that uh, that episode, and it's, it's let's just play the whole thing. It's back. so good. Um, so what I had wrote for my note here was, uh, "Hot damn, this was a great episode." Trying to narrow down, uh, trying to narrow it down to one takeaway is really hard to do. If I did have to pick just one, it would be the 33, 33, 34 rule. It's incredibly important to pay yourself, but also pay the tax man and uh, to uh, to reinvest in your business. You know, this like I said, this whole episode is gold. If you haven't seen it yet, go watch it. It's it's freaking awesome. Yeah, Brett was really great. We actually met him at WordCamp when you came down to Texas and we went to WordCamp together. He was one of the speakers at WordCamp. And uh, at the end of his speech, which had nothing to do with pricing pro pricing projects, he said, you know, if anybody wants to talk to me about pricing, I love talking about that. So we went and like sought him out and said, hey, we got this, you know, silly little show. And would you come on and be a guest with us? And uh, he followed up with us, you know, like the next day and said, yeah, let's get on there and talk. But yeah, the <clears throat> the 33, 33, 34 rule is something that sticks out to me too. Um, and just making sure that you're <clears throat> like accurately assessing how profitable you're actually being. Mm -hmm. Because when you start to factor in things like, uh, you know, you have overhead costs. Like my overhead costs are pretty low because I work from home and I don't have any staff and this and that. So my overhead costs are low, but they still exist, you know. So you do have to reinvest money into your business. Um, you do, of course, want to get a paycheck. And uh, when it's tax time, you better have all that money saved because that can be very expensive. Oh, so, yeah. yeah, but there's tons of good stuff in that episode, especially if you're, you know, focused on trying to get pricing right. Uh, there's lots of good ideas. And I, I know, too, like I've changed some of my uh, payment schedule process and kind of how I onboard clients through things that I learned in that episode. All right. So on to episode number nine was a healthy WordPress community with Dan. Maybe uh, Dan is like a pillar of how you should be uh, a figure in the WordPress community, you know, so he's giving back way more than any of us have ever thought about. And so his focus is uh, kind of in mental health and uh, how we as WordPress professionals kind of deal with the mental health side of things because a lot of us are kind of shut in by ourselves alone talking with people on the internet all day and not really having a whole lot of human interaction and that can be a drain on mental health but just in general uh, mental health is a thing that everybody uh, struggles with and goes through different uh, episodes with and it's important to be something that we're talking about so him like taking part of an initiative to have us all talk about that, I think is extremely important. And I definitely want to have him on, you know, like once a year and let's talk about this again, you know, cause it's something that doesn't need to go away. That's true. <clears throat> uh, what are we on? I guess, uh, episode 10, the keys to content marketing with Kim Doyle. Uh, I mean, 
a great talk about how content marketing is just plain marketing. You know, on your site, speak to the client about the client and how you can help them. Less about you, more about them. Case studies. Case studies are, are great for that. You know, it allows you to, uh, to kind of brag a little bit, but it's focused on not what you are, but way more about like how you're helping clients. And that's, that's what clients care about. Like they don't care how you do it, how, you know, what, what development stack you have. They want to see results. They want to see like how you can help their business. So when you're, when you're doing content marketing or writing content or marketing, uh, really focus on, on the benefits of, you know, the end goal, the, uh, the client. Yeah, absolutely. Like Kim says, everything is content. Yes, indeed. All right. Number episode number 11 is email isn't dead. You're just not doing it right with Dave Toomey and Pete Everett, two of our favorite people. I actually was looking at our podcast analytics the other day, and this episode is like in the top three of the most views. So uh, it was a really good episode where we we're kind of talking about the importance of building an email list, not only for yourself, but uh, offering that as a service for your customers. Um, so a lot of it, it went well with the content one before it and, and kind of led into this. And uh, since then, I've been doing a lot more email marketing, especially through the admin bar, but uh, for a couple of my customers and for myself. Uh, but the line of the whole episode for sure uh, was when Dave Toomey was kind of comparing email marketing and social media marketing. And I went back and tried to get this quote exactly the way he said it, but he said, with email, I can talk to my potential client. With social media, I always feel like I'm having to shout. And that is the truth. That's the gospel right there. Because, uh, you know, with email, you can have those one-on-one conversations. And, And I've been surprised, like sending out emails for the admin bar, how many people reply to that email and start a conversation with me. Mm -hmm. So if you get one of our emails, you can hit reply and talk to me. I'm the one that answers it, you know, so you can, you can have those one-on-one conversations, but with, you know, with your Facebook page, you know, like most businesses, you know, have a Facebook page, you do have to shout to get any attention. That's like, you have to pay Facebook a bunch of money or shout. Uh, And it's, it's not super effective. So I think that was, that was definitely the quote of the episode for me. No, I, I agree. Well put. Uh, episode 12, Building Accessible Websites with Heather Gray. So this one was an eye-opener. Uh, Heather clearly lays out the uh, the different ways that websites should be accessible to everybody and how so many just aren't. As designers and developers, we tend to, to look at, like, you know, user flow, functionality, aesthetics, like, all of that stuff, but it, it, it really shouldn't stop there. Like, contrast, font size, clear copy keyboard navigation and there, there's so much more and i think that uh you know like me i i don't have an issue with my eyesight i don't have you know any of these these hurdles that uh, that other people do so you know when you're designing a uh, a website and you you don't have these uh these these issues you're not going to think about it not necessarily so you know making sure that whatever you're building is accessible to everybody is it, it really is important and even more so now um and you know the larger sites and everything there's there's been reports where people uh people are getting hit with like large fines because their sites aren't accessible and that totally makes sense like i get it and that's why we uh we need to be all encompassing here yeah. And call, call me kind of a hippie, but I, I just kind of believe that the innate good in all people. And then I especially believe that the WordPress community is innately good people. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, part of the reason why we wanted to book this show, we did have some questions about it that kind of led us to this. But part of the reason I wanted to book this show was just to raise our consciousness of this issue, because I think the, the more we think about these things, the more we'll implement them. And there was tons of good tips in that episode on, on tools you can use and stuff like that. Um, and it's definitely made me think as I'm developing a website, like uh, even when I'm setting like a color palette uh, for a website, well, let me run that through a, a colorblind test and make sure that this color palette looks good. Because a lot of times I'm just going with what do I like, you right. know, which is super subjective. Um, but to be able to actually put it through there and then say, okay, this is actually going to be effective uh, for people that are colorblind. And not only is that just good for people who are colorblind, a lot of times it's just good design principle because those kinds of things like the contrast and stuff 
uh, work well. Uh, but it's also something you can report back to your client and say, Hey, listen, you know, I picked this color palette because a, it fits with your brand. Uh, B, you know, it, it looks really nice and pleasant. Your, your, your users are going to like this, you know, and C, this works well for people who are colorblind, making your website more accessible. So there's, there's all kinds of reasons it's good. I think it's just something we got to think about more often. Absolutely. So episode uh, 13 was the pros and cons of co-working with Roby Lawrence. And Roby is one of my favorite people uh, on earth. Dear Lord, so I yes. hope, <laughs> shout out to Roby if he is uh, listening to this at some point. I think it's probably the middle of the night there. Um, for sure, the best part of the episode is at the very beginning when Roby introduces himself and says that uh, this is me in a nutshell, and he actually like photoshopped his live video feed inside of a nutshell, uh, which was completely unexpected to all of us. And you can tell by like the you know sixty seconds of us just kind of giggling in the background and nothing happening that we had no idea what was going on. Yeah, this was one um, of those guests that uh, up until that point I had no communication with him. I didn't know him. This was like really the first time I, uh, I I got to meet him and uh, I, I he immediately won my heart and uh, yeah for you know, sure he's, he's and, just such a great and, guy too and Roby has a podcast too he's in Australia and he focuses his podcast on uh, website developers and stuff from Australia so uh, shout out to Australia and shout out to Roby so go check that out uh, there are uh, links to all that in the show notes to episode 13 but what what I remember most about like the content of the episode was there are tons of ways to co-work. Like before I was thinking I needed to get in my car and go drive to some shared space with a bunch of, I don't know, weird smelling people drinking expensive coffee. And uh, I don't know, it just didn't seem like my thing, but there's really tons of ways to co-work. And, you know, his first co-working experience was just getting buddies together, you know, at their house and working together. Uh, you know, me and Matt will be working on stuff while we're on the phone or on a zoom call. So there's lots of, well, lots of different ways to co-work. And I definitely think co-working is good for you just in general. All right, episode 14, <clears throat> excuse me, Seeking a Work-Life Balance with Nathan Wrigley. Uh, so Nathan joined us to talk about work-life balance and how important it is to make sure that you're not heading towards a burnout or a breakup. Um, you know, being able to turn your brain from work mode to life mode is really necessary. It's, it's incredibly important to balance your life as, as a whole, you know, like being able to... Uh, to really just put stuff down, walk away, be with the family, and be like mindful of yourself. Um, that's it's really important, and I think the, uh, the like that that's really just a broad statement about the uh, the entire episode. Because for me, it was it was difficult to pick one particular point in that uh, that episode. I think the entire thing was was really well put together. Um, I think that, yeah, and I think what's best about it too is like none of us tried to be an expert on this. Like right. Nathan said multiple times, like, why are you having me on to talk about this? I'm like, that's exactly why, you know, because it's something we all struggle with. You know, I do remember a story from, from what he told though was, I think he said his dad worked from home and he had certain shoes he would put on. So right. if he was wearing his like business shoes, everybody in the house knew he was working and it was work time. And when he took those off and put on his slippers or whatever, you know, he was just at home and not at work anymore. And I thought that was like kind of a cool way to kind of balance those things. I'm terrible about it. Like just really almost hopeless. Uh, but I have been better about like making sure I schedule time off. Like I'm going to block this off of my calendar because like this appointment is with my family, you know, because I'll, I'll use my calendar for all kinds of appointments with customers and like nobody can mess with me when I have that appointment. So I need that same kind of thing, like just for my mindset for, you know, working with my own family, which is kind of sad, but you know, if it works well, for me, it works. I mean, you run a business like that's, it's, it's amazing. And I mean, I, I know anybody out there listening that's uh, that's got an agency or, or, you know, they're freelancing or whatever, like the amount of time, blood, sweat and tears that you put into this thing it's it's a huge endeavor you know it takes up it, it becomes part of you you know and as much as as that's so prevalent and so important it's you need to be able to take a take a step away too yeah not always easy to do though so i'm glad to have that reminder uh so if you struggle with that that would be a good episode to go listen to for sure 
Um, so we're up to episode number 15, which was client focused solutions for your agency with Laura Elizabeth. Although I will say we got into a lot more things than that. Laura is a pretty fascinating person that I'm super like jealous and impressed uh, with. Uh, she has all kinds of cool things. So she developed client portal. Uh, she launched Project Pack not that long ago, and she's actually got something new that she's going to be coming back on the show. I think the second, it's the first week of April, she's going to be coming back on with us, and we're actually going to do kind of like a webinar style episode um, uh, with her walking through some design tips and stuff like that. Uh, talking about building better portfolio websites. So I, I know pretty much every web developer has some sort of portfolio. So that's going to be super cool, but I'm promoting the future. We're here to talk about this past episode. So I think, uh, you know, what really inspired me from this episode was talking about like client onboarding and how important that is and working on your process. So one thing that I talked about in that episode was I, I bought project pack from her. And one of the things that stood out to me right away is she had this onboarding flow chart that she uses for customers. And it's, it was just really nicely laid out and it went through all the steps. So you could tell the customer, here's what you, you should expect. And one little silly thing that was on, it was just like the way it was color coded uh, to know what was the client's responsibility and what was the developer's responsibility. So that's something that I implemented away. In fact, if you go to ogleweb.com forward slash process, you can see I basically took that flowchart and made it into uh, like a web version, which I uh, send out as a link to my customers as part of my onboarding process. That's uh, part of the package of things they get. Um, and I use that same color coding scheme and everything. I pretty much stole everything from Laura on that page and just kind of adapted it to what my process is. But uh, she is awesome. And I'm super excited to have her back on again because I got tons to learn from her. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right. Episode 16, um, how to set up OBS for Facebook live streams. Uh, so this was just Kyle and myself. Um, and this this episode was fun because it was, um, you know, it was something that, that was kind of like a, a lot of people in our group wanted to uh, wanted to see. So although we didn't have a guest, uh, we, we ran through how we set up OBS and do exactly what we're doing right now. And, um, you know, I, I think that the uh, the best part of this episode was just being able to, to answer those questions and, and help everybody in the uh, the uh, the admin bar community um, get OBS up and running a bit better. Yeah, and we got a lot of questions about that as we started doing this, um, like how we did that, and we would kind of explain one off. So it was nice to actually make like a tutorial for it. And several times since, I've had people ask me, and I'm like, "Boom! Just go back to episode 16. The whole thing's right there." So right. Uh, hopefully, that's been a help for people. All right, just a couple weeks ago, we had episode 17 uh, titled "Finishing Projects on Time and on Budget." with Beth Livingston and Beth has become one of my favorite people in our community. Um, she is, she's just got processes and, um, you know, uh, project management down and I have a lot to learn from that as well. So I think part of this onboarding thing, like the link I told you about on my website with the process, you know, that's kind of a mixture of, uh, the way Laura Elizabeth set hers up. Um, and a lot of the different, theories and ideas Beth gave us and Brett Phillips from a past episode kind of gave us. Um, I think one of the things that I changed immediately after watching this episode, and I, I'm, I'm reminded that a lot of times we get just as much out of doing these interviews as anybody else would, you know, so I feel kind of selfish that I just get to soak up all this awesome knowledge. Um, but one thing that I implemented right away and I've used ever since this episode is when a client comes to me uh, brand new and they want kind of a, a quote on a project, I'm sending them to my project discovery form, which gives me enough detail to give them an estimated range for a budget up front. So I'm saying, based on what you're telling me, this is going to be between five to $7,000. If that sounds good to you, um, we can go through a discovery process and, you know, hammer out the nuts and bolts of everything and I can get you an actual, you know, an actual 
uh, bid on this project. But starting with that range is super important because you're going to find out so many things about this project going through the discovery process. I don't know how many times we've almost been done with the website and the customer said, yeah, but uh, where's going to be all my products listed for sale? I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We never talked about e-commerce. You know, that's going to completely change everything. So giving yourself kind of some leeway up front with providing an estimate range, I think is the the biggest thing I took away from that episode, but there's a hundred other things in there as well. That's true. <clears throat> episode 18 was uh, building a better agency through outsourcing with Chris Castillo. So this was our first repeat guest. Uh, Chris joined us to talk about outsourcing and growing our businesses. Um, so it was it was similar to the uh, that episode two talk um, where they did go into uh, to go you know like picking your your outsource team and um, I think that my biz- biggest takeaway from episode eighteen was again you know talking about how to choose and communicate with the folks that you're going to be outsourcing projects to and how to manage those people so episode two touched on this whereas episode 18 really went in uh like gung-ho full force uh learning more about uh like really how how to choose these people why why some are better than others and not based on skill but kind of based on you and how you communicate and how you need to find people that communicate in a similar way like you need to be able to communicate with 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 these uh these outsource teams in a way that uh, that they understand and if you can't or if you like your way of speaking doesn't really hit the mark with them then you're it, that's just going to lead to problems so you know really really picking somebody that you're able to to go back and forth with and then you both understand each other is so important yeah i think you're never going to get the results you want to out of outsourcing if you just go on something like fiverr and just to hand over to somebody like learning how to be the person that outsources work is a skill on its own Absolutely. Uh, and i think there's lots of good tips and stuff in that episode about that and just to plug again you can go to outsource.services which is a project that chris launched that he's trying to use to help people become better at outsourcing and find better part of stuff so uh, definitely cool to go check out you can get a, a free listing on there right now all right and last week's episode Split testing for WordPress just got easy with Adam Lacey. I didn't make any notes on this episode because it's fresh on my brain, but I will say um, Adam's somebody I've known for a couple years now since I first got into WordPress and he was, you know, I saw him a lot in the Beaver Builder community uh, and I've always really liked Adam, but I think Adam has like struck gold with this because uh, split testing is something that I think is pretty important to do and I'm learning more and more as I get more advanced with projects or find projects where customers can spend a little bit more or you know changing uh conversion rates by a percent or so could make a big difference in their money uh how how important split testing is and just how hard it is to do in wordpress right now there's just not a great solution um so i bought his uh product split hero in the pre-sale which is all sold out now so sorry if you missed out on that um, but it's going to make it super easy to split test pages by basically making two URLs, putting those URLs in your dashboard. It's going to run the test and give you a report. And it doesn't get easier than that. And that's the only way I want to do it. Like, Absolutely. Because it makes it super easy. Yeah. So that catches us up, Matt. Uh, yeah. Yeah. How, uh, how do you like that? We just went through uh, about 20 weeks of, uh, of content. And yeah. you know we're just touching on very small aspects of each each one of these episodes. So if something you know if you're if you're new to uh, to the admin bar and one of these sounds interesting, definitely go go watch the full episode because there uh, there's there's going to be a lot more content in uh, in all of them. Yeah, uh, this is called content repurposing. Absolutely. And uh, some content that we're not repurposing is uh, the Q and A section. Uh, so Kyle posted a. Uh, well, Kyle, explain explain yourself and your hat and your beard. Explain myself and my hat and my beard. Yeah, Kyle posted a, a photoshopped version of himself saying that uh, that he, he oh, wants Oh, okay. To... Yeah, yeah. Uh, so somebody else actually posted that as part of Photoshop Friday, uh, and I just reused it because it was awesome. <laughs> but basically, we want to try to answer some of the questions y'all have. Um, 
if you can see me on the live stream and I look a little distracted, it's because I just spilt a giant glass of water all over everything. So uh, trying to multitask right now. Um, so yeah, we wanted to try to answer some of the questions people have. We try to do our best to answer questions while we're in the group, um, but sometimes that can be a little bit hard to do or you know, it's kind of hard to write out all that in text. So we wanted to try to take some questions and go through them. Uh, so we let people just ask questions and then we took all the questions people had asked, put it into a poll and let them vote on it. Um, so we're gonna roll through some of these here and give our answers to them. So are you ready? I'm gonna ask you the first one, you answer it, and then we'll go back and forth, okay? Sounds good to me. Awesome. All right, so should a new agency start with publicly priced plans to build a client base, then move to custom pricing or use custom pricing from the beginning? So I want to, uh, I want before I, I give my answer to this, I do wanna say that this is my opinion and sure. it's by no means the right way to do things. Um, you know, different, uh, different market areas and, uh, you know, it, there's, there's a lot of different variants. But for me, I don't think that I would start with publicly priced plans, mainly because you, like, especially as a, as a small, just starting out agency, you may not know enough to, uh, to really put your prices out there. Um, <clears throat> Me, my, uh, I, man, I char, I way undercharged when I started my business, and had I put those prices out there, you know that 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 would be what people are used to or what people would expect, and it would be a lot harder to scale at that point. Um, so I think that custom pricing is probably the way to go, and I mean, even ten years on, I don't put my prices out there because. I do value-based uh, value pricing, so it's really difficult to say, yeah, it costs this much. Um, it's a client-by-client -client basis, and depending on who they are, what they're, you know, how much that website is going to pull in for them. I've got clients where their sites are, you know, brochures, and I have sites that uh, the client, you know, I'm, the, my one of my more recent uh, clients, every month they're pulling in in warm leads between 150 to 200 thousand dollars. So the prices of both of those are going to be horribly different. So you right. know, putting those prices out there may not be the best thing, especially in the beginning. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say briefly, you know, I kind of have a hybrid of the two. I don't publicly put any of my pricing on my website except for uh, on my care plan page, it says starting at and that's the only like dollar figure that's on my uh, website. But I do have kind of a structure in place as far as where I start out pricing projects so that I can be a little bit consistent and it helps me be able to build proposals or get those estimate ranges that we talked about a little bit quicker. So I do have some like, you know, is it going to have this, 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 and I can kind of build out a good idea on the pricing right away, but I do not put it publicly. So question two, when selling support plans such as Kyle's care plan, is it safe to upsell slash bundle them with design plans? For example, if you buy a starter plan, you get subscribed to a normal support plan and a pro plan, you would get priority support or sell them as separate plans and let the clients tailor according to their needs. Knowing clients will always need the the least until it's uh, it's time to need more than the least. Right. So I, I feel like I'm pretty well positioned to answer this because I've done it several different ways and I've had a ton of success with my care plans. Um, so I used to have the typical, what you see on 99% of care plan pages, three packages, you know, the small, the medium, the large, you know, uh, with the large being something nobody ever bought, but in hopes that they would buy the medium to kind of fall in the middle. What I found is none of my customers fit very well in a box. And what I do for one customer, even though if the, their plan, they might be on the same plan, what I do for them is quite a bit different because their needs are different. Uh, so what I've moved to doing and what I found super successful and I'm really happy with this model and I don't think that I will change it is I have that, um, starting at price for my care plan. So the website says these are the base things it comes with and it's website hosting and so many updates a month and your plug-in licenses and updates and backups and all the like standard stuff you'd find in a care plan. And that starts at $100. Now, 
I'm not really signing them up for the care plan until we've built a site. And I don't do care plans for people who I didn't build a site for. So by the time we get to that point, I can accurately assess what kinds of things they're going to need every month. And I'll say, okay, I think, you know, it's pretty safe to assume you're going to need me designing something a couple hours a month. So let's budget that in. Uh, you want me to track some keywords so we can keep on track your SEO and find out what things we need to target. Okay, great. Let's add that and just build a custom little menu for them. And that's what I charge them. So I have, uh, all my legacy clients are about on $75 a month plans and they all get the same thing. Uh, since January 1st, I moved to this and I've had a lot of success. Uh, so they're all on different pricing points. Um, but it's all set up with recurring billing anyway. So it's not like a hassle to do it. I set it up one time and it's done, but I really get to tailor that to their needs. And what I found is I get to charge a lot more for care plans now because I'm saying, I'm building this for exactly what you want and you're getting exactly what you want. That's why you're paying this premium. Right. All right. So question number three, SEO rookie question, but what are the best resources to learn on your own, how to rank in a specific area, especially a nearly virgin area you're willing to target? Yeah. I mean, if we're talking about like a rookie question, I would say, yes, uh, I would go follow anything Chris Castillo, who's in our group has to say, he does an excellent job with SEO stuff. There's lots of SEO questions, uh, in their group. Um, there's tons of good resources online, but you know, I think the basic things that, um, that I focus on when I'm doing with like local SEO stuff would be uh, making sure you got a Google My Business listing, get a Bing Places listing, whatever kind of citations you can have, that's great. Um, and then Schema. So I use Schema Pro, uh, which we do have an affiliate link for if you go to our recommendations page on the admin bar. That's what I use because it's awesome and super easy to use. But you can put in all the local business schema, which is uh, which is really useful. Uh, I've done some questionable SEO efforts as far as with my own business and with a couple clients uh, doing some like location based landing pages. So uh, I live in a town called Granbury, but there's you know 15 other towns in this county, and I've set up some landing pages that specifically target those other towns. Uh, and I've gotten results from that. I rank in those other towns. So if people are searching for like the local keyword phrase, so if they're searching for web design, my town, Texas, uh, I'm coming up in those places for the, for those phrases, which is great. Uh, and it gives me more avenues. And I do get questions sometimes like, Hey, I'm 30 minutes, you know, they'll call and they'll tell me they're 30 minutes away from where I actually am, but they think I'm there, uh, with a quick little explanation, they get it. They understand it doesn't seem like to be a big deal. But I think those things are super important with uh, with local SEO stuff. So uh, that's where I would start. Awesome. So do you want to tackle this cold calling question then, Matt? Um, sure. So okay. Uh, so it says, uh, "Do you cold calling? Do you do it? And if you do, how do you prepare for each one?" I don't. That's that's my answer. I don't cold call. I haven't. Um, actually, as as far as as outreach goes. Um, Man, I guess I uh, I don't prep for that because I, I just don't do it. Kyle, do you do it? No, I, I do not cold call. I have cold called. Uh, I've had better luck uh, cold knocking. So like walking into a business or mm -hmm. let's say I'm in a restaurant that I like and the owner's there or something or whatever kind of business and uh, kind of starting up a conversation that way a little bit more organically. Uh, I hate getting phone calls I didn't ask for. So I just don't want to do it to other people. Uh, people do have good luck with it. Mm -hmm. um, you just got to get used to being rejected. You know, I keep getting spam phone calls from telemarketers because it works. Uh, it doesn't work on me, but in general it works. So you have to have thick skin. Um, I would imagine prepare you a good script um, and just be willing to get rejected like a hundred times. Yeah. Um, I think uh, it's, it's a better at it. huge numbers game. I mean, I, I I don't know what the conversion rate would be, but it's it's going to be very very low, right? So this was an interesting question. I think we should both kind of talk about. Uh, Richard Bland asked us, "How would you go about funding a new website project if you had no money?" 
I'm talking minimum $10,000 fundraising. So we did try to get some clarification from Richard on this one uh, as to what the funds were being raised for. From our understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, and we might both be wrong in our understanding, but he needs to raise about $10,000 for he- for himself to be able to fulfill this project. Uh, it's not the customer needing to raise $10,000 to pay for it. He's got 10 K that he's going to have to put into it. And how would you go about raising 10 K in order to land this job? Yeah. And I think that that is what he's asking. I'm not, uh, again, like if we're wrong on this, uh, Richard, like, you know, let us know. But, um, as far as that goes, I mean, if, if your project is going to cost you 10 grand to build, then I would say that you need to three to four times that to your client so that your down payment is covering that expenditure um, and you get that before anything else. Um, that way, if it falls through, you're not spending your own money or your business's money. You're spending that down payment, which should be non-refundable, you know, like, I also, depending on how it's structured, where that money is going, um, you know, if, if you're outsourcing and like part of that 10K is going, going to be spending um, on your outsourcing, if I think he did mention like there's some legal uh, teams that need to be brought on. So some of that's going to them. And it, it really depends on the project itself. Um, I've done it in ways where, you know, I, I'm i outsourcing to people. So I'll, I'll take that... Um, that down payment, but I'll split the project up. So if I'm doing the layout and the, uh, you know, like the, the, the functionality of the site, but it needs, um, let's say a searchable database. Um, I don't do database development. I'll hire out somebody else. But in this case, because there's so much, uh, money that it costs to, uh, to hire somebody to build a database, um, and the one that I'm thinking of in particular, you know, that's, that's a risk that my, I and my business don't necessarily want to take on. So my client is going to hire that other person separately and they'll do their thing. They'll, uh, they'll take their down payment. I'll take mine down payment. And then at the end, we're all working together. We'll launch that project. So I think there's, you know, there's, there's those two different ways of, of tackling it. Kyle, what do you think? Yeah. So for me, you know, the only way I can try to like wrap my brain around a website costing him $10,000 is he's got staff and he's got some significant functionality that needs to be built that he's outsourcing. So it's going to be expensive. Well, there's no way in hell I'm spending that money until I've gotten paid. Uh, and like you said, you're going to, if it's, if it's going to cost you 10,000, you need to be charging 40,000 for it. Uh, so even if your down payment was 25% and you would be able to pay for that. So for me, I, that's why I've, I've struggled with this question because it doesn't even compute in my brain. Like I'm going to get paid for this before I ever spend it. So mm-hmm. I might be missing something. So the only other thing I can think of is you could go get a, a small short term loan for pretty affordable. If you feel pretty good about um, that, this is going to get paid back and you have a solid contract and stuff. I'm not one to borrow money. I don't borrow money, um, but lots of businesses do borrow money. And you could probably, with the right contract and stuff in place, you could get a bank to fund this without a problem uh, and and pay it back as soon as your customer pays you. I wouldn't do that. That wouldn't be my advice, but it's a, it, it's a possibility. Yeah, yeah. It's it's definitely the the riskiest of them because, you know, worst case scenario, you are on on the hook for 10 grand. And I mean, that's, that's that's not a little bit of money or just ask matt to borrow 10 grand yeah i I won't i won't do that sorry guys tried (laughs) so hopefully we answered that question uh the right way i'm not sure but uh you know if not comments all right what we got next matt uh we've got uh how do you get clients what are some of your marketing strategies Awesome. This is a good one. And this one gets asked a lot. I think this one, I forgot to go back and look at the poll. I had a power outage, but uh, I forget which ones had the most votes, but this one was in the top of it. So, um, you know, part of this has just been dumb luck for me. Uh, The first work I started doing was volunteering for a nonprofit doing work for them, which then they recommended me to somebody else. And that snowball just come. Most of my work is referral based. I don't do any marketing for that, although there is some that I do. So 
Um, it's important when you get done with the project to ask a customer for a review um, because when you have that review publicly displayed, somebody that knows them could see that and, and build that trust. The other thing is to let your customer know that you need referrals and you want referrals. So I will explain to them basically, you know, it depends on the customer. I don't have a script for it, but basically I'll just tell them, you know, my business relies on referrals. Most of the time they were, they were to me because of a referral. So I'll say, you know, I want to make sure I go thank so-and-so for sending you to me, you know, if you know anybody, I would love to be a referral for you. You know, uh, you know, you can pass along my information. I can give you some business cards or whatever you want, you know, whatever makes that easy, but ask for it. They, they might be more than willing to refer you and just never think about it. But if you ask for it, they're more likely to do it. Other than that, I do SEO work for my website. So I come up well locally, um, semi-regionally I come up well. Uh, so I do get inquiries weekly from just people finding my website through Google. Um, and I do a little bit of in-person networking. I'm like part of our chamber of commerce. So I'm listed on those things. I don't attend a whole lot of it. Um, and then of course, online marketing. So I spend a lot of time in Facebook groups and talking to people. And, uh, you know, I, I pick up jobs here and there when people are needing some help. So that's basically everything for mine. Uh, it's not really complicated and I don't do a lot of it and I definitely don't spend any money marketing. So what about you, Matt? Yeah, I think, um, actually I went back and, uh, I went to my Facebook ads, uh, dashboard and in the last 10 years I've spent 200 and something dollars on, uh, on marketing. And that was all in the beginning, you know, like that, uh, that was when I was, I, I really didn't know what to do, <clears throat> but, um, Man, it's uh, it's current clients that with return projects. Um, that's that's my number one source. My second is referrals because that's that's coming uh, with that built-in trust from the other person that they know. So much goes, easier to land a job when you so got a referral. Easier. It's yeah. true. Um, so you know, other than that, SEO. Like if you type in uh, web design or graphic design um, in New Hampshire or Keene or like wherever, uh, I come up pretty well um but uh other than that man yeah i don't do too much in the way of marketing it's uh it's referrals and it's it's repeat clients um actually you know to to add to that um something that i did recently was those those um those clients that you have that you know they're one and done and they're, they're it's it's pretty much over they didn't want a care plan um, something that I, I did with these guys uh, a couple of weeks ago was, you know, their, their sites have been out for three to six months or whatever, and they haven't needed anything. They've taken on the responsibility of updating their sites and which and means they're not everything. doing it. What's that? I, I said, which means they're not doing it, right? They're either not doing it or, or not nearly as, uh, as, as often as they should be. But regardless, you know, I, um, I took a look at their sites, like how they're doing, how they're ranking. And of course, you know, when I'm building a site, I'm doing it in a, uh, in a way that they're going to hit that, uh, that mark on ROI. Um, so, you know, I want them to see that what I did was, uh, was it worked for them. So I, I got all of these clients together, um, and I made some, uh, drafted an email that basically said, Hey, so-and-so just wanted to touch base with you. It's been six months. It's been three months uh, since your site's been launched. And uh, it's coming up for these the, these search queries. Uh, you're in the map pack for these. You're on the first page for these. Like what we did is working. I just wanted to say, hey, and uh, just let you know. Um, so it's a little bit of a, a brag, but like not really. It's, it's more, you know, just reaching out and saying, hey, you know, you spent your money wisely. And I want to say that over half of the people that... Uh, that I sent these emails out to that I hadn't spoken to in quite a while came back and said, Oh, you know, that's awesome. Thanks so much for, uh, for letting me know. And by the way, could you do this? And I need some print work and I need some stickers and this, that, and the other thing. So it actually, it brought in more work from, from, you know, yeah, I want to say dead leads, but, uh, people that have gone cold. Yeah. And Jim Galliano talks a lot on his podcast about like keeping that communication channel open with your, past clients and stuff and sending, you know, I, I've done where I've just, 
uh, turned on the webcam and sent a little video to him saying, Hey, how's it going? How are things been with the business? You know, just kind of chit chat stuff, but it's really personal, you know, uh, they can see me, hear me, all that kind of thing, which makes a pretty, pretty big difference. Um, I did see here, we would have to wrap this up pretty quickly because I do got to run, but we did get two more questions on the live. Let's try to run through those real quickly. Okay. And we have one more question, which was the top voted question in here that we'll get to last. So the first one says, uh, pre-contract discovery sessions, how can you accommodate on not letting it leak outside, say 30 to 60 minutes? I know it's a simple question, but I had a session which turn, turned into a strategy session going on to three hours. So I will say for me, uh, what I've learned on many of these episodes from Brett Phillips and from Beth and from plenty of people is to get paid for discovery. Mm -hmm. um, so part of my process, what I'm doing now is providing them based off their discovery form, which is really simple baseline information. I give them a range. If they want to do that, if they want to move forward with that range, I charge them 20% to get started. And that 20% covers their discovery session uh, where we're going to have a, you know, a three hour meeting. Um, and I'll produce them with, you know, a scope of work document uh, so that they have that, whether they choose me or not, but I'm getting paid for that time. Now, if they go ahead and use me for the project and everything, you know, all that's absorbed into the cost. So it didn't cost them anything extra. I'm just getting paid before we have a three hour meeting. Deal. Yeah. I mean, that ditto. Um, that's, that's exactly how it, how it really should be done. Um, you know, I, I do the same thing. I actually, I left a uh, discovery meeting the other day. Uh, well, actually, I guess it was a, a couple of weeks ago, but they, they really didn't have um, nearly enough put together. Like they didn't really know how, how the, uh, the flow of their business was going to, uh, to take shape. Um, like they were taking online orders, like how they were going to, uh, to manage these orders, this, that, and the other thing, and not just the, uh, the online aspect of it, but you know, these are things that are going to, uh, to take a little bit of time to, uh, to develop, uh, at their location and then be sent back out. Um, and they, they didn't really have that put together yet. And during our meeting, um, I, I, you know, we, we kind of workshopped it and said, okay, so if this is the way that it's going to work, like this is the next step and this is the step after that. So, you know, discovery meetings, if you're charging for them, you know, whatever you give them should be worth, you know, whatever you're charging them. But most of the time, you are giving them quite a bit of value. So they, they should be paying you for your time. And I will say quick tip before we move on to the next one, when I get on a Zoom call or a phone call with a, uh, with a client where I'm doing something free like this, like so that first initial conversation, first thing I tell them is, hey, I have another call in 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And just put that in their ear at the very beginning that your time's limited. We're going to have to get through this. So I picked that tip up from somebody. So thanks, whoever that was. But basically... At the very beginning, I tell them that we're going to have to stop in 30 minutes. Whether I have something or not, it puts that limit. And then when we're getting about five minutes to it, hey, we got about five minutes left. Is there anything we need to cover? All right. So we do have a question that says, I would like to hear from Kyle what you would have been doing wrong now if you wouldn't have taken the No Fear Funnels training. So, I mean, the best part of the course that has changed the way you were doing uh, before taking it. So I do have an email that I drafted speaking of email marketing, that will come out at 12 Eastern today, right as No Fear Funnels goes back on sale. Um, I didn't know what to write in the email without sounding sleazeball. So yes, we are affiliates to this program. Um, but even if we're not, in fact, you can just go to nofearfunnels.co and buy it from there and we don't get anything. So if you're worried about us taking cut from it, you know, it's whatever. I don't, I don't really care. Of course, we'll appreciate your affiliate money. But I didn't really know what to write that mailsy. So what I write way too long email, you'll get it at noon Eastern, uh, talking about a story of what happened to me right after I took the course. So quickly, basically I walked into the meeting, they wanted a prettier website. And I started talking about the strategy of what a website could really do for them. And some, you know, I didn't call it funnels, but some marketing we could put into place where we would capture some people to try to get them into their business for the first time. Uh, so it completely changed the way I had that meeting. A $2,000 project went to an over $5,000 project. And this was like a week after I started the course. So it paid for itself immediately, but it's completely changed just the way I think about the value I bring to a project. I'm not thinking about just the aesthetics 
of what we're going to be building. I'm thinking about, you know, how can we convert more leads? Um, what are the foundational things I need to put in place so we can track all this stuff? It's just really made me think a lot more analytical about the websites that I'm building and build something that generates more for my clients, you know, so they don't have to wonder down the road, is their website doing anything? We're going to put some goals into place before the project starts. We're going to measure those goals over time and we're going to be able to tweak those things in the end. So it's just really, it's changed the way that I've positioned myself. But above that, Dave is a fantastic teacher. If you don't know, he spent years actually teaching elementary school kids. Uh, he's a licensed teacher. You can definitely tell that in the course that he knows how to teach people stuff. The videos are like flawless. Like it, I've worked with Dave on some projects and I hope he doesn't mind me saying, but he is a perfectionist. So we're talking things need to be pixel perfect. And the, all his videos are like perfectly put together show notes and all of them for exact transcripts, bonuses all the time. I mean, it's 347 right now. It's going to go up to 497 in June. It's 10 times what he's charging for it. Promise if I had to pay for it every year, I would absolutely do it. No questions asked. Awesome. So the uh, the last question, the, uh, the top rated one is by uh, Matt Davies. And he asks, what goals do you have for the next 12 months? And how are you keeping track with them as you progress? So first part of that would be what kind of goals do you have for the next 12 months? Thanks for, thanks for your question, Matt Davies. So I see you're here live. So hello, Matt. Um, so what are, what kind of goals do I have? You know, I'm kind of maybe, maybe I look at this kind of the wrong way, but my goals are all monetary. Like I do this to make a living. So I'm looking at what my sales goals are for the year now. So there's that overarching goal of at the end of the year, I want to have X number of money or sales uh, from stuff, but then that's broken up into a lot of things. Uh, what my goals are monthly to meet that, how many care plans I want to have by the end of the year, because I know that brings in that recurring revenue. So I have a lot of things where it's looking down. Um, I took what, what my sales were last year and raised the bar by 20%. And that's my goal for this year. Um, so I have something to strive for every month. I know exactly every month what I made last month and I've raised that number 20% to know if I'm on track or not this month. Um, but all my goals are pretty much structured monetarily. How about you, Matt? Um, yeah, I mean, mine are too. Yeah. I have monthly goals. I have yearly goals, uh, and it's all sales. Um, and I try to hit those targets every every month. Um, and actually, Kyle and I have co uh, phone calls at the end of every month, and we're just like, "Hey, like, what what were your totals this month?" And uh, we've kind of gamified it a little bit. But I actually, when I first started uh, doing this uh, as a as a business, I created a very simple um, spreadsheet that basically puts all of my goals, all of my totals. It's a way for me to tr keep track of what. Uh, what projects are open, what projects are closed, who still owes money, and, uh, you know, not only all of that, but <clears throat> it's um, the way that, like, you know, the uh, the, the names and, uh, like, what the projects were, I can sort them at the end of the year and say, okay, this client, you know, as a total uh, was, you know, they were responsible for this chunk and, you know, these clients weren't, like, if there was a problem client throughout the year, I can see like what their totals were. Is that worth it? Is it a client that I need to think about dropping? You know, all of these types of things um, all spread like stem from this one uh, this one spreadsheet that's actually over the course of the last like hmm, seven years has grown and like morphed into into something completely different uh, but still the same. Um, but yeah, it's it's this uh, it's this spreadsheet that I. I use almost every day. Yeah. So when, when we saw this question from Matt, um, I started talking to our Matt, this Matt about, uh, uh, about that spreadsheet that he uses. Cause I I've seen him in it before when we're screen sharing and stuff. So we actually had the idea, like this could be super useful to other people. Uh, so we've been working the last week or so on tweaking it to make it more applicable to everyone. Matt's is very, focused on the you know his business in particular so i was able to kind of look at it from an outsider perspective and like how can we make this still work um but you know adaptable for everybody's business so keep an eye out uh hopefully tomorrow maybe thursday 
we're going to have this thing out and ready for everybody. Uh, and we actually did a bonus um, calculator where you can actually put in all kinds of information about a job and actually see how profitable you are on it. It's mm -hmm. super quick, easy to do. It just takes a second, but you can actually account for everything and start seeing how profitable you are on jobs really when everything's done. Um, so pretty exciting. We'll have more information on that coming soon, but uh, keep an eye out for that. That was our little teaser that we were going to wait till the end for. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the uh, that, that extra bonus piece that uh, that Kyle came to me the other day and he's like, hey, I built this. We should give this a uh, this this away with the uh, with the the spreadsheet. And it's it's really interesting the way that you put it together, Kyle, like the uh, the fact that we had like what, a, a, a twenty five hundred dollar job. And with the uh, the expenses and the taxes and the, uh, you know, the the 30 percent the savings like all of that stuff like we were actually the way that it was put together how many hours went into it um what was the the total was like negative four um, dollars mm -hmm. so had we taken this this uh this job for 2500 bucks we would be losing money in the end so i think that's a, a it's really freaking cool to be able to uh to take like a, a possible or a potential job before you send that quote out and really make Double sure check. that you're going to be in the black instead of the red. Yeah. Cause it, the spreadsheet makes you account for some things you might forget about like overhead cost, uh, saving for taxes, saving to reinvest in your business. How many hours you're going to put it to either one of us charge hourly. Um, but, uh, it, you know, you work, you know, you only have so many hours in a day to work. So, you know, you have to account for how many hours you're putting into a job. So more information coming soon, but let's uh, let's get this thing wrapped up now. This has been a forever long episode and I do have to run. I will say we already covered no fear funnel stuff, so I'm not going to go over that again. Uh, we talked about um, Chris's outsourced services, which I definitely want everybody to go get signed up for. Keep an eye out in the group this afternoon when Dave Foy goes live. I'm going to share that into our group. So if you do have any questions, you can get those over to him. Uh, next week, we're going to have Devender on, and that's going to be an excellent episode. Um, anything I'm missing, Matt? I don't believe so. I think okay. we need well, to. Well, that's uh, it for this episode. Oh. Yeah, we need to we need to end this episode before you uh, your, yeah. your internet goes down again. Absolutely. So uh, that's it. Thanks for sticking with us through the technical difficulties. And, uh, you know, as a reminder, if this group helps you in any way, the easiest way to help us out is to share content, subscribe to our podcast or YouTube channel, or use our affiliate links. It's free. It takes little time and it greatly supports the show. We will see you next week. get gray hair yeah man i can't wait to have gray hair i think well, gray hair is badass you're in the right profession <laughs>